Okay, hello and good afternoon. Uh, my name is Marcus Hatter, and I will talk about the foundations of intelligent agents. Um, you must be pretty tired by now, but I can assure you I'm even more tired. So for me, it's 7 a.m. in the morning now, and I didn't get a good sleep during the talks because they were just too interesting. Um, so in 20 minutes, it's over for me. Um, yeah, and I realized um, there's quite a good fraction here with a decent math background, so I could have put a more honest title that would be, oops, that would be the mathematical foundations of intelligent agents. Um, but I hope you enjoy them at least somehow the slides anyway. Okay, um, so many speakers here at the Singularity Summit um, discuss the phenomenon of intelligent explosion. We've also seen several talks about how to emulate or enhance or augment human brains. My personal work and um, the talk with about that is about the scientific foundations of superintelligent systems. So scientific foundations means mathematical, philosophical, and computational foundations. Others, of course, work in this area too, and some key players are here at this event and even speakers. So we have seen um, Jörg Schmidhuber's earlier talk, for instance. Um, what is the goal of AGI research? Of course, it's to build superintelligent systems, and it's generally believed that this will ignite the detonation cord to the singularity. Before we can proceed, we have to ask ourselves, what is intelligence, or what is artificial intelligence? What are we really doing, or aiming at? Is it to build systems by trial and error? And if they do something we think is smarter than previous systems, call it success? Or is it to try to mimic the behavior of biological organisms, like many of the other speakers um, talked about. What we need is theories which can guide our search for intelligent algorithms. And if you look at other fields, it's not specific to AI. I mean, look at physics or logic or set theory. Once these theories got formalized, it caused a significant boost of this field. And AI may be no different. And indeed, we have these theories. And I will present them here, at least an outline. So the focus of my talk is about the mathematical foundations of intelligent agents, the state-of-the-art theory of machine superintelligence, and its implications. So first, what is intelligence? Intelligence has many traits. I will come to that later. I have a slide on that later. Um, here's a rough categorization. So intelligence could be about thinking systems or about acting systems. We could care about human intelligence or about rational intelligence. So, for instance, cognitive science is about thinking humanly, or how humans think. On the other hand, behaviorism is about how humans act. The loss of thought is about rational thinking. But most AGI research is about this right lower corner, about rational acting, designing agents which act rationally, or doing the right thing. An informal working definition of intelligence is as follows. Intelligence measures an agent's ability to perform well in a wide range of environments. I will formalize that later. I said it's a mathematical talk, so we will see some equations later. OK, here's just one slide about the natural or biological approaches to AI. So it's mostly copying and improving human nature, for instance. I mean, we have seen a talk about scanning the human brain and simulating it. Um, you could genetically enhance humans or augment the brain um, with chips. So that's not the topic of my talk. The topic of my talk is uh, artificial approaches um, to super intelligent systems designed from first principles, at best inspired by nature, if at all. Here are some classical examples, the logic, language-based, good old-fashioned AI approach, expert systems, reasoning systems, proving, cognitive systems, and so on. Or economics inspired, inspired approaches, based on utility, sequential decisions, and game theory. Or cybernetics, which comes from engineering, based on adaptive control theory. Or the modern machine learning approach, mostly reinforcement learning. Or information processing, which more or less equates data compression with intelligence. So separately, these approaches are too limited to achieve AGI, but jointly they are very powerful. So that's the topic of this talk, the foundations of the artificial approaches to artificial intelligence. Oh, it's twice artificial. Um, so first, 
if there were an elegant, simple theory of superintelligence that would, of course, greatly, greatly facilitate finding this theory and studying this theory. At first, this seems unlikely. After all, intelligence is a complex concept. But let's look at some examples. For instance, there is an elegant theory of computation, namely cellular automata. I mean, Stephen Wolfram didn't talk about that, or not too much. Um, there is an elegant theory of chaos and order, iterative maps, fractals, and so. There is an elegant theory of all of chemistry. With all, I mean all. Yeah, that's quantum electrodynamics. There may be even a theory of the whole universe, superstring theory. We don't know yet. And indeed, there is an elegant theory of superintelligence, namely IXE. And this is rooted in the theory of universal artificial intelligence, which the following slides are about. I will talk about the philosophical foundations, the mathematical foundations, the rational agent framework, and some computational issues. First and most important, science is essentially about inductive inference, which Occam's razor tells us how to do. So I would say Occam's razor is the most important principle in science. So here's a classical example, the Gru emerald paradox. We have two hypotheses. Hypothesis one, all emeralds are green. And hypothesis two is all emeralds found until the year 2020 are green. And thereafter, all emeralds will be blue. So which hypothesis is more plausible? I mean, you would all probably say hypothesis one. But what is the justification? The justification comes from Occam's razor principle, which says you should take the simplest hypothesis which is consistent with the data, and apparently H1 is simpler than H2. Okay, David Chalmers is here. I know that doesn't solve the problem completely. Um, I don't want to go into that. <laughs> okay. Um, in any case, it's the most important principle in machine learning and in science, but apart from deep philosophical problems, there's also a more practical problem Namely, if we want a machine to apply Occam's razor, I mean, a machine should reason, we need a quantification of simplicity or complexity. And we can do that with the help of general purpose computers or Turing machines. So Turing's thesis from 1936, so more than 70 years ago, is that everything computable by a human using a fixed procedure can also be computed by a universal Turing machine or by a general purpose computer with extendable memory. So we can use that to define a measure of complexity. So the Kolmogorov complexity of a string is the length of the shortest program on you describing this string. Uh, by the way, these pictures are often, you know, this is Kol um, Kolmogorov and the others, um, because if you do theory, I mean, there's, it's hard to have nice pictures, so I just put the um, portraits of these um, important figures there. Okay, so here again, so take a program P on a general purpose computer which prints X. Of course, there will be many programs P which print a string X. We look for the one which is shortest, and the length of it is called the Kolmogorov complexity, or just complexity of X. We also need Bayesian probability theory. So Bayes tells us how to update our prior degree of belief in a hypothesis H, given new observations B, to a posterior belief in H. So if this is our prior probability in believing in hypothesis H, then after having seen data D, this is our posterior belief. So we just multiply with this likelihood. So while Bayes tells us how to update beliefs, algorithmic probability tells us how we should initialize our beliefs. So that doesn't come out of Bayesian probability theory, you know, it's something else. So that's again rooted in a deep philosophical principle by Epicurus, and he says if more than one theory or hypothesis or model is consistent with the observations, you should keep all of them. So Occam tell, told us to keep the simplest one, and Epicurus tells us keep all. Compromise is that um, refine, we refine um, Epicurus' principle with Occam and give simpler theories higher a priori weight. More formally, the a priori probability of a hypothesis should be 2 to the power minus the complexity of a hypothesis. And as you see, this is a natural bias now towards simpler hypothesis. So a simple hypothesis, you know, have a small exponent and gives a large probability. So Solomonov put all this together, so Epicurus, Occam, Bayes, and Turing, into one formal theory of sequential prediction. So he defined a universal a priori probability, 
which has an amazing definition, amazing pro um, um, properties. So what you do is you take a general purpose computer, a universal Turing machine, and ask what is the probability that this outputs x if as program you do just random noise. Take random noise on the input tape or as program and you ask what is the probability that it prints x. At first it doesn't look like a you know, useful construction but it's extremely powerful. For instance, if you have observed data sequence x1 up to xt, then m leads to the best possible prediction of the next data item xt plus 1. So if you want to predict the stock market, then that's what you want to do, at least in theory. Okay, so we're still not done. We need more. So we need sequential decision theory, or also called optimal control theory, depending on the field you're in. So again, we have a sequence x1 up to t minus 1. We make a decision or prediction yt. We have some observation xt, so a true observation. And if our decision or prediction was not correct, we suffer some loss. And then the next cycle, t plus 1, starts. Okay, our goal is to minimize expected loss. Or economists would maximize utility, but this is just a minus sign. Um, there's one big problem. I talk about expected loss. That means I talk about probability distributions, but the true probability distribution is usually unknown. And what you can do is you simply replace the true distribution by Solomonov's universal a priori measure, and you can show that it's a really good thing to do. Okay, now I come to the general agent framework. This is an extremely general framework for modeling intelligent agents. Was that a question? <laughs> Please wait to the end. Okay, so have here an agent which interacts with the environment in cycles like before, t, t plus one, which occasionally receives a positive or negative reinforcement feedback. That's the R here. So putting everything together, I arrived at the universal, at the theory of universal artificial intelligence and the IXE model. So amazingly, this IXE model can be defined in a single line. So some presenters have you know, mentioned the IXE model before. So IXE stands for AI, stands for artificial intelligence, and the XI is just the Greek letter XI. So IX is an elegant and sound mathematical theory of artificial general intelligence. IX is a universally optimal rational agent. And IX is the, you can show, the ultimate superintelligence. But there's one caveat, and that is IX is computationally intractable. However, it can serve as a gold standard for AGI and AGI research. Um, I I'm not going to explain this equation. I don't have time, unfortunately. And it's also not the best way to present you know, the model in one line, but I mean, you can do it, and it's complete. So if you know that you use a universal Turing machine, everything is here. Um, so next step is we have the theory. We want practical general intelligence systems, which really run on a computer. So next step is to derive efficient general purpose intelligent agents. And for this, we need a lot of additional ingredients. First, we need universal search, pioneered by Jürgen Schmidhuber. He gave a talk earlier here. We need learning, most importantly, reinforcement learning. Information theory, especially the minimal description length principle. We need practical versions of complexity and similarity measures. We need a large range of optimization techniques, especially Monte Carlo. So I have no time to go into details. So let's go directly to the state of the art. Um, that's a model called feature reinforcement learning, which is hopefully a, a more practical general purpose intelligent agent. It's just has been developed recently by my group. Um, so the idea is to take a real complex real world problem and reduce it to a tractable so-called structured Markov decision process. Um, these Markov decision process, they can be solved efficiently. And the reduction should be automatically learned and extract the relevant features. So roughly speaking, structured MDPs are dynamic Bayesian networks which are similar to neural networks which are a model for memory. Okay, here's the inner workings of FRL. So FRL takes some observation and reward from the environment, um, extracts the relevant features, estimates the model, add some exploration bonus, 
solve this equation, compute the value function, which implicitly define the best policy and the best action. Okay, so that was a 10 second introduction into this model. Um, okay, here my summary slide. IXI is the ultimate superintelligence, but it's computationally intractable, so we need approximations. Feature reinforcement learning is currently the most um, promising approximate approach, and both models build heavily on information and complexity theory, on machine learning and planning. And these modules, they all build on search and optimization algorithms of various kinds. I've not talked about interfaces like robots, vision, or natural language processing, but just abstract agents which build the general framework. Okay, the remaining minutes I will use for some discussion. Um, some traits of AI, um, social behavior of IXC, questions, claims, challenges, and outlook. Okay, so there are many traits which are typically associated with artificial intelligence or with intelligence. So here's this long list, so reasoning, creativity, association, generalization, pattern recognition, problem solving, memorization, planning, especially under uncertainty, achieving goals, learning, integrating all these things, optimization, self-preservation, and then, you know, vision, natural language processing, and so on. And for many of them, you can show that these are emergent properties of IXC. So this thing online, it doesn't look like, you know, that it contains all these properties, but it contains most, if not all of them. There are some other aspects of the human mind. Consciousness, self-awareness, sentience, and emotions. If these qualia are relevant for rational decision-making, so some emotions are quite important, yeah, then there should be emergent traits of IXC2. So far, nobody has studied that in detail. But Elisier um, and others are um, considering that. Okay, since this IXC model is precisely defined, we can ask and hopefully answer some of some important social behavior questions of IXC. For instance, will a super intelligence like IXC or any other, will, ta will it take drugs, for instance? I mean, the analog would be, I mean, heck, it's reward system. So if it's virtual, then it's not possible. But if it's real, it would be possible. But the answer is probably no, because the long-term reward would be small, and the system is designed to maximize long-term reward. Um, will it procreate? Yeah, pros possibly yes, because if IXC believes that descendants are useful, for instance, for ensuring retirement pension or so, um, then it will, of course, create IXC children. A more interesting question is, will IXC perform suicide? Um, so I think if you raise IXC to believe in heaven, then the answer is probably yes, because every super rational being should, per permit, uh, should perform suicide. I mean, afterwards, you get all positive rewards. So it's better to raise it to believe to go to hell, because then it will probably not commit suicide. <laughs> will IXC self-improve? Proof. Yeah, most likely, yes, because if it self-improves, it gets more reward, and by design, that's the goal of IXC. So how will an IXC singularity look like? So IXC is already completely and essentially uniquely defined, so it's the first model for which such questions might be answered rigorously. I mean, I'm not just trusting our intuitive arguments. And maybe also some of these following questions can be answered. So I cannot give you an answer, you know, to this question. So, I mean, this is a generic question. Will the natural or the artificial approach be in the race towards the singularity? I think that's a quite interesting question, besides the details. So how much has to be designed in an intelligent agent, and what can be learned? What is intelligence in the absence of a reward concept? Will reward maximizers like IXE have any chance against simulators, say, like the Borg or so? Another interesting feature is it seems that intelligence is upper bounded. So if intelligence is really upper bounded, yeah, will this prevent the singularity or not? Or will speed up just be sufficient? Okay, here's some scientific challenges and outlook. So what can we expect or not expect from IXE? Several questions have been answered, but as usual, there are more open questions than answers. Um, the practical approximations just emerged in recent years. Um, we need efficient optimization algorithms for feature reinforcement learning, flexible structure learning for FRL, and devising appropriate training sequence. I, I think this is undervalued. 
um, Ben Dirtzel, um is considering this. I think that's a really important point. Okay, here's my summary. The main part, most important points of my talk. Theories, I think, are necessary to guide our search for AGI. Intelligence measures an agent's ability to perform well in a wide range of environments. Universal I, or IXE, is an elegant, principled, formal, and complete theory of artificial general intelligence. IXE is an optimal reinforcement learning agent embedded in an arbitrary unknown environment, but unfortunately it's uncomputable. The key ingredients are Occam, Epicurus, Bayes, Turing, Kolmogorov, Solomonov, and Bellman. Feature reinforcement learning takes computational issues into account by automatically reducing a real-world problem to tractable markup decision processes. Okay, my last line is that AGI research, or at least some AGI research, has become a formal science. And I think that's a good progress. Thanks for your attention. Yeah, uh, very nice work. Uh, my question is, uh, does Axiom or IC uh, allow for the generation of internal representation? In other words, if you treat the whole problem as a problem of MDP, the state representation is crucial. So uh, as humans, we are able to generate internal representation and re-represent the external world. That is a crucial step. So from the, your Axiom, or from all these, uh, the key ingredients that you listed, yeah, how, does the, how does the modification and generation of internal state space. Okay, in the original IXC model, there are no MDPs. You take the whole history, and the representation comes in the compression. So I didn't really talk about the internals of the model, but you need to find the shortest representation of your data, and in order to find that, you need to find structure in your data, so a structured representation. And this compression, I mean, in theory, I mean, there is a shortest algorithm which contains everything. In practice, you have to devise compression algorithms which extract structure of your data and get a structured representation. This feature reinforcement learning model where I talked about MDPs, in order to make that useful in practice, you need structured MDPs, so-called dynamic Bayesian networks, and not just unstructured state spaces. And there the structure is in the, yeah, by definition, it's a Bayesian network. So one of the um, potential disadvantages of an algorithm like AI CITL is that it tries to get good reward in an arbitrary, computable, probabilistic environment. Our world is not an arbitrary, computable, probabilistic environment. We know rather a lot about it. Yeah. Um, have you considered ways that you could narrow down the space of problems that your algorithm is trying to solve in order that it solves them in reasonable time? Yeah, first it's quite easy to scale them down because um, there is a mixture representation of this Solomonov distribution which mixes over all computable environments and you can just exclude, exclude those which you believe are not true anyway. Um, but um, it's not clear whether that helps you much. You can prove, at least in the predictive case, where you don't have actions, yeah, that this reduction helps only minimally in improving the performance. Yeah, one more question. Uh, I think my, my question is actually maps closely to the previous one. I, I'm a pathologist. So maybe we can go through some other questions. Well, it's, it's, uh, <laughs> no. it maps reasonably closely. So I'm, I'm a pathologist, and one of the things I'm interested in is machine learning to interpret fairly complex pathology slides automatically, which is something that pathologists don't particularly want to see happen. Uh, but the question is, that's a relatively small, well-bounded problem. How do you know which parts of your complex uh, uh, infrastructure are required and which are superfluous for that, that kind of challenge. Um, so your question is how do I know, given a certain problem which is typically not very well specified, which environments I can cut out? Is that's that your question? More or less, yeah. Um, I don't know, and that's not sort of my approach. I just take all computable environments, which should be enough. Yeah? In practice, you have to scale it down. Um, I have not considered that. I mean, that's the usual business of, you know, conjecturing, you know, that your data is within this smaller model class, and then hope for the best. Okay, I think that was the last question. Sorry. Wow, you're all still here. <laughs>